Welcome to Words of Grace, radio ministry of Elder Ben Winslet, pastor of the Flint River Primitive Baptist Church near Huntsville, Alabama. We invite you to stay tuned to today's broadcast. broadcast today is entitled Your Identity in Christ. Both in our recent messages here on Words of Grace and in the pulpit of Flint River Primitive Baptist Church where I serve as pastor, it seems that our time in the Word as of late has been dancing all over passages from the New Testament which involve God's people being in Christ. That terminology, in Christ, occurs all through Pauline epistles. In fact, it's just a common way that Paul refers to God's people. Over the coming weeks here on the broadcast, I want to consider that phrase with you, one epistle at a time. In other words, everywhere in Romans that we find the phrase, in Christ, I want to consider the words attached to it in that context. And then the same with the book of 1 Corinthians or the book of Galatians, so on and so forth. And I believe this will be a very comforting and instructive study for you. As a bit of a preface, some foundational information that we need up front. In the King James Version of the Bible, that phrase, in Christ, occurs, ironically enough, 77 times. That phrase is used to denote our connection to Christ as his people. His people are in Christ. Our relationship with him is encapsulated in that title, as is our secure position in Christ. It's a phrase that not only speaks to our salvation, but it speaks to our identity as individuals, But also, as we will see today, our identity is a collective body of people, who we really are. To be in Christ means that we were represented by Him and in Him upon the cross, and as such, in Christ we have redemption, we have justification, we have forgiveness of our sins, we have salvation. In fact, we were even, according to Ephesians, chosen in him before the foundation of this world. So this is a very important biblical phrase, one that will be a fantastic word study here on Words of Grace, and it would be a wonderful word study for you in your own personal devotional life. Now, today our focus will be on the in Christ occurrences in the book of Romans. There are a number of these actually, Sometimes the Greek phrase translating most commonly as in Christ is translated in Romans as through Christ, and so we will consider those as well. And in studying these passages, we'll find these in Christ statements from the book of Romans and some of the most beautiful statements of salvation 
in Paul's epistle to the church at Rome, but also in some obscure places like Paul's mentioning of other believers near the end of this letter. So let's begin digging in. We have three basic concepts that we want to consider today on the broadcast regarding being in Christ, people who are in Christ Jesus. First of all, we want to consider together statements of salvation, the in Christ remarks in the book of Romans that speak to our eternal deliverance of sin. Secondly, we want to consider the in Christ statements that emphasize this side of salvation, as it were. In other words, if we are in Christ, then there are things that we no longer have. There are things that we're no longer seen as being because Christ has taken away our sin. And then lastly, we want to consider this phrase with reference to our relationships one with another, who we are and how we are connected with one another, according to the Apostle Paul, here in the book of Romans. And again, this is all in Christ. These are things that we are in and through our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, we want to consider statements of salvation using this phrase, in Christ, here in the book of Romans. And the first passage that we look to is Romans chapter 3 and verse 24. Romans 3.24 reads as follows, Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Though all have sinned, verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and though the wages of sin is death, as we read in Romans chapter 6, through his grace we are freely justified through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That is to say, there is redemption in Christ Jesus. So we are freely justified. That is to say, we are declared righteous. The word justify is a legal term. It's a term that belongs in a courtroom. The words new birth, those are words that belong in a delivery room. They convey new life. The word sanctify, those are words that belong in a temple, referring to those who have been called out as the called out assembly of God, as sanctified, as set apart for holy usage, event, or person, or thing. Those are religious terms, consecrated terms. The word justify is a legal term. It's one that belongs, again, in a courtroom, and this term means that through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have been made righteous. He looks at us, and he sees the life of his Son. Or as the book of 2 Corinthians 5.21 would say, He that knew no sin was made to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We have been justified by his grace through the shedding of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are justified in him, made, declared, righteous, legally not guilty by the redemption that is in Christ Jesus in his grace when he died for us upon the cross of Calvary. So let's think about this for just a moment. We are declared not guilty despite being sinners, by Jesus' offering, because of Jesus' offering for us on the cross, and this justification is by God's unmerited favor, which means that you don't earn it, it's free, and that's why the word freely is used here. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but we are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. What a beautiful statement is that. In Christ, we have redemption and justification, and this is freely and purely by the grace of Almighty God. Another one of these salvation in Christ statements that we read in the book of Romans is Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. We have been given the gift of eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And the words through Christ in this passage actually translate from the same two Greek words in Christo, and it's basically a synonym term in the Bible for in Christ. 
through Christ, in Christ. We are saved in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. So, in or through Christ, we have the gift of eternal life. Now, while God the Father chose us before time, which we emphasized recently on the program from Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, and even though the Holy Spirit has quickened us to eternal life from death in sin to life in Christ, again, life in Christ, all of this salvation that we preach, that we believe, that we know, that we trust, that we have hinges on the death of Christ. You see, God chose people, but the people that he chose were guilty of violating his law. The Holy Spirit would have no legal basis to inhabit the hearts of sinful human beings without the redemptive work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so through him, we have been given all things freely, as we read in the book of Romans chapter 8. And This includes the gift of eternal life. The wages of sin, again, is death, and all men have sinned. Therefore, all men shall die. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, and therefore we will all die. That is why there is a completely fresh group of human beings on the planet today than were here 140 years ago. And in 140 years from now, there will be a completely new group of human beings on this planet as well, because every single one of us will die as we are sinners unworthy of living forever. That's what we earned. That's our wages. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord, and he has given unto us all things freely. So from these two passages Romans 3.24, Romans 6.23, we learn that we are justified, redeemed in His grace, and this is given freely to us. And at the same time, we've been given the gift of eternal life, despite the fact that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. God has given us, by grace, freely, the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And again, Romans 6.23, through Christ comes from the same sort of language that often translates in Christ. And so I wanted to include that in our study today, in our focus today, the words in Christ from Romans. This brings us to the next point that we want to consider The in Christ statements showing the results of Jesus' salvific work and the security that we have in him as his children. So let's look together at the book of Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. There is therefore now This is a cliche, silly thing that preachers say, and perhaps even some language teachers or literature teachers would say. But any time in writing that you read the word, therefore, you have to ask yourself the question, what is the therefore, there, for? Well, in the previous chapter, Romans chapter 7, the Apostle Paul wrote of himself before he knew Christ. He wrote of himself thinking that he was justifying himself through the law, He wrote of his existence as the command to eternal life came, and he was struck down, as it were, on the road to Damascus. And from that point on, his life is different, but it's not perfect. He does things that he doesn't like. He doesn't do things that he wants to do. In fact, he often finds himself doing things that he hates. And he finds it a law, even, that when he would do good, evil is present with him. And so he comes to the conclusion of Romans 7, and he says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, how do we have deliverance from the body of this death? Through Christ Jesus our Lord. So then, with his mind, he served the law of God, and with his flesh, he served the law of sin. And so in verse 1 of chapter 8, What we just read for you was the closing remarks of the book of Romans chapter 7. As we come to chapter 8 and verse 1, we read, There is therefore now no condemnation 
to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Despite Paul's failures, despite his previous way of living when he was so awful and sinful, rounding up and persecuting Christians, despite the fact that he still had struggles with the flesh each and every day of his life, even when he would do good, evil was present with him. Despite all of that, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Walking after the Spirit here has reference to being born again. Otherwise, we would be exclusively carnal-minded if we were not born again. We walk after the Spirit. The Spirit has come into our hearts, and this is our personal A.D., whereas before we were in our personal B.C., as it were. And so walking after the Spirit has reference to those who are born again. They have the presence of the Holy Spirit in their heart. The Holy Spirit is in their lives. They know God. The law of God is written on their heart, and from the heart, the Spirit of His Son cries, Abba, Father. That is the condition of a born-again person. The Spirit is within them. Paul would say regarding those who are void of the Spirit in this chapter, that they are carnally minded, that carnal mind is death, they cannot please God, as you see in verse 8, so then they that are in the flesh, that is exclusively in the flesh, cannot please God, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. So that defines what Paul is talking about here. When he says, in the flesh, he doesn't have reference to the way that my grandparents would use that term when they got irritated or when their sin nature came out a little bit, which it all does for all of us, in the flesh. I got in the flesh the other day, and I said or did X, Y, Z. But in the flesh here has reference to people who are unregenerate because that is equated to not possessing the Holy Spirit. And so you're not in the flesh, but you're in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. So we're clearly speaking of things that are positional here. We're not expressing, we're not reading thoughts that are practical, though there are some practical applications built upon that reality in this chapter. To be in the flesh is to be carnally minded, to be at enmity against God. They cannot please God, but we are not in the flesh. We are after the Spirit, as it were, not after the flesh. So the first thing that I want to emphasize from this Romans 8, 1, in Christ statement, we're not of those that don't belong to Him. We're not of the unregenerate. We're not of the reprobate and because we've been born again and the Spirit dwells in us, there is no condemnation to us. We are in Christ. There is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Think about the awesome assurance that that statement affords us. There is no condemnation for the child of God. You might think, well, I'm a terrible person sometimes. I say things I don't need to say. I do things I don't need to do. And you would be exactly right. And the same is true about me as well. However, in Christ, because he has died for me, because I was represented on the cross, because the Spirit has come into my heart, in Christ, because my true identity is in Christ, there is now no condemnation for me or for you or for anyone else who is in Christ Jesus. Look at Romans 8, 2. So we learn in Romans 8, 1, there's no condemnation to those in Christ. We're looking at the effects of being in Christ. In Romans 8, 2, those in Christ are made free from the law of sin and death. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ has made us free from the law of sin and death. Think about that for just a moment. You have freedom from the law. Now, that's true in an Old Testament sense. You are free from the law as Jesus fulfilled it to a jot and a tittle and died for us upon the cross of Calvary. 
We're not under that Old Testament law anymore. They were referred to as the weak and beggarly elements, that which waxes old and is ready to vanish away. It was referred to as that which causes bondage. It is a yoke of bondage which no one has ever been able to bear except our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. But we're also from the penalty of any of God's laws. Now, the Old Testament law of Moses was written to the Jews that was given to the nation of Israel. But there are laws that God gave mankind that we violated. Our fathers violated. There are things that God has said not to do all through the Bible from one end to the other that you and I are guilty of either in our minds or in our hearts or even with our bodies, with our actions. The Ten Commandments are a great example of that. But we've been made free from the penalty of any law that we have violated of God. And we're not just made free from the penalty. Now, that would be great, but we would just be criminals who escape justice. We have been made free from the guilt of violating God's law because Jesus Christ took our guilt on himself as we were there represented in him on the cross because he took our guilt on himself. We are free from the very guilt that caused us to stand in violation of the law, which would have resulted in us being penalized for breaking his law, the penalty for breaking his law being the second death and eternity in the lake of fire and conscious suffering for what we have done. So when we say that we have freedom being in Christ. Just understand that we are beyond free indeed through and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Check out this amazing language from the final verses of the book of Romans chapter 8. Because of the work of Christ, there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's our in Christ statement once again. Let's begin reading in verse 31. Now, Paul had previously written that God foreknew, predestinated, called, justified, and will glorify his people in Romans chapter 8 and verse 31. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him, through him that loved us. Did you hear all the glorious statements of eternal security in this run of verses? If God's for us, who can be against us? Who shall lay anything to our charge? It's God that justifies. Who is he that condemns us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ, despite the fact that we're counted as sheep for the slaughter and killed all the day long. Paul says here, I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. Because God loves us in Christ, and because Christ died for us, there is absolutely nothing that can separate us from this love of God, which sent His Son into the world to die for us. Not death, life, angels, principalities, powers, anything that's happening now or anything that will happen in the world. No creature, including yourself, can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. These are blessings that we have in Him. Lastly, today, we want to consider this phrase with reference to our relationships one with another. 
Four times in the conclusion of the book of Romans, Paul references others who are in Christ as well. These passages are Romans 16.3, Romans 16.7, Romans 16.9, and Romans 16.10. Paul generally concludes his epistles with greetings to individuals and commendations to individuals that he knows in that church body, or perhaps words from people that he's present with to that church body. The first that he mentions are Aquila and Priscilla. They were Paul's helpers in Christ, a remarkable, wonderful couple that he addresses in this chapter. Romans 16, 7 says, Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners, who were of note among the apostles who also were in Christ before me. Now, what that means is these people were born again and following Christ before Paul was born again, and then following Christ. So these people were in a relationship with Christ before the Apostle Paul was, and so they were in Christ before him, referring to chronology. In Romans 16, chapter 9, salute Urbane, our helper in Christ. He is a helper like Aquila and Priscilla in Christ. And then again, in verse 10, salute Apelles, approved in Christ. This man, Apelles, was approved in Christ. So, referring to these individuals, they are people who are helpers in Christ, who are in Christ before Paul, people approved of note among the apostles, and you have people who are approved in Christ. Now, Paul obviously had special relationships with these people with whom he had such an incredible bond. But let's consider this in closing today. For the entire body of Christ, we are all together in Christ and connected one to another. As Paul was connected to Aquila and Priscilla, as Paul was connected to these various other people, Urbane, Apelles, all of these different people, we are to one another connected. Look at Romans chapter 12 and verse 5. Romans 12, 5 reads, So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. In Christ, we have connection one with another. And that's one of the major points that you can derive from these in Christ statements here in the book of Romans. So, in summary today, we have salvation in Christ. This salvation is effective in our lives in Christ so that there is no condemnation to us, and we are individually and collectively in Christ a special, peculiar people delivered from our sins and connected one with another. I'll close today with a simple reading of Romans chapter 15 and verse 17. I have therefore whereof I may glory through Jesus Christ in those things which pertain to God. And that we say indeed and amen. Again, I'm Ben Winslet, thanking you for listening to Words of Grace today, inviting you to write and let me know that you've received today's broadcast, and also to tune in again next week at this time. Until then, may the Lord's richest blessings be yours, is my prayer. If you enjoy the messages you hear on Words of Grace, consider this your invitation to visit a Primitive Baptist Church in your community. An online directory is available at marchtozion.com. Copies of this and other broadcasts are available for download on iTunes and on our website. And finally, Words of Grace is a listener-supported program. To contact us, address your correspondence to Words of Grace Radio, 641 Moontown Road, Brownsboro, Alabama, 35741, or visit us online at flintriverpbc.org.